Guru Nation, this is a very special episode all the way from Bulgaria. Tihomira Nikolova. This person, like, out of nowhere, one morning, mm-hmm. every morning, I check LinkedIn. I try to look, what can I post that's funny, funny meme. I just try to post before I go to the clinic. And one morning, I saw, like, all these notifications. I'm like, what's going on? It's more than usual. And it's all started from Tihomira's post where she's on the cover of a magazine. Her article was published. And I was like, wow, this person's cool. I need a, I don't know why I'm tagged, but let me look into her. And then I realized the post, like she's writing about me and I'm like watching it, looking by myself and I'm like blushing by myself. <laughs> like what, what, how is this possible? I got to get you on the podcast. You're, you're obviously super accomplished. Uh, you're a CRA two uh at a yeah. CRO in in Europe, Eastern Europe, and you've been in the CRA space for it looks like or the, you've been in the research space since like 2017 more or less. Yeah. More and, or less. I've been around. <laughs> I mean, you're just getting started, I think. You're you're also yeah. the CRA wizard, which is really cool. The logo, I mean, there's a lot of symbolism here with this logo I'm looking at. Uh, maybe that's an hour podcast just to look at the logo but let's talk about all of this stuff but thank you so much like and congrats on your accomplishments that was really cool thank to see. you thank you and thank you so much for having me it's such an honor i've been a huge fan since young cra once upon a time wow <laughs> as yeah. you found out recently from my post and this is really amazing i really appreciate the opportunity that well internet is freaking amazing internet's amazing for all the bad that it, we hear mostly about the bad there's a lot of good stuff like meeting i had no idea my my reach was global until like a few years ago it is i didn't it re- is like I, and i told you before the interview if i knew like that uh in the future all these cra's would have started from the video i don't think i would have started because it's like a huge responsibility like i don't know a lot of the times people disagree with me oh and this is actually not correct this is this but the point is like not the details it's the big picture like the big picture i'm pretty confident i'm correct on the thesis of how to get started the fundamental and then once you're in you got to figure out details on your own but definitely you are i can confirm (laughs) but thank you so much i mean it means a lot to me and now that i'm more aware like you know i i try to produce better stuff and a lot of it's interviewing experts like yourself on so thank you you're now sharing the responsibility (laughs) no thank you honestly your work is amazing and it has been amazing and it helped me a lot throughout my career and i'm sure it helped to many 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 other people so it's really amazing seeing you you and being able to talk to you in person almost almost so, yeah. you gotta come out you ever come out to any conferences here or is it just the europe ones uh no not really i think the last conference i've been on was the gastroenterology european conference last ah, okay. year okay um it was those are the better Vienna. ones anyways the the, the like yeah. therapeutic area i like those better but like they don't do like acrp or socra or magi over there like in europe they do it occasionally, not so much in the recent years. I feel that after COVID, um, there were not that many mm. conferences. And actually, this was one of the reasons that I started uh, Clinical Research Bulgaria community and started organizing these events myself. Wow. Because I was searching for events to go on and to have some networking and to mingle with people in our space. And I always felt they were coming short in terms of in terms of there were no conferences. So at some point I've just decided that I'm going to start organizing events. So actually next month we are celebrating one year since my first event. Wow, congrats. Um, So thank you. So in May, Clinical Research Bulgaria is turning one. So we're gonna have a little birthday celebration locally in Sofia. (laughs) That's big time. (laughs) Like there's a robust I was talking to you again before the show about Eastern Europe specifically, and it's over the last decade, it become a hotbed for research because there's a lot of talented Definitely. people. I mean, my parents are both doctors from Romania. 
Like, mm. I know in those countries, they take education and still do seriously. Unlike maybe in the West, you know, in the West, who kind of slipped, slipped off of that a train. But in the East, Eastern Europe, it's like they seriously still value education, especially the STEM, STEM, STEM topics. So uh, it makes sense that there's a clinical research infrastructure in, in Eastern Europe, similar to Latin America. Latin America in the last decade, yeah. exploding. I just went, came back from Mexico City. You would think you're in um, North Carolina with all the research that was over there. Unbelievable. I actually, I actually have never, never had any experience with Latin America, but I've read a lot about it. You would love it. Really, you would love it. Yeah. It's similar to Eastern Europe, but uh, like with a Latin flair, obviously. But you with would love Latin it. Vibe? Latin yeah, vibe. Latin vibe, for sure. Love it. <laughs> yeah, you would love it. Um. So how did you get actually get started though? Because uh, I imagine it's similar to the U.S. where it's not something that's known. You have to like find it by accident or how did you discover? No, no, no. So I was 17 and I was still in high school. And since I was in um, science high school, natural high school of science and maths, I was profile biology. And basically I was figuring out what's going to be next. And I knew I wanted a career that's going to be a dynamic. It's going to be in pharmaceutical sector. And I knew that definitely I did not want it to work as a pharmacist. Okay. <laughs> so naturally, then Why? I went to medical school. Because when I was <laughs> because when I was younger, it seemed like the most boring job in the world. I remember yeah. my parents <laughs> taking me to pharmacies occasionally. Uh, to buy some drugs and stuff and I remember that each time I was thinking man this <laughs> must be the most boring job in the world so yeah. fast forward I went to medical school and started <laughs> studying pharmacy makes sense <laughs> yeah it makes sense and um, I already I already knew about clinical research space I I've done a lot of research on the internet and basically I was trying to figure out what it is, how to start, what are the different positions, different roles, the whole concept, the idea, a brief overview of clinical trials. And as you know, back in the days, there was absolutely no information about it. And each time when you actually try to ask someone like a teacher or uh, another grown up person what actually it is, they were looking at you like you're an alien. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, eventually I found out about clinical research, monitoring in specific, and then I later on I found you, and I've decided, okay, I want to be a CRA. So now, how do I do that? And how did you? Um, well, definitely I was looking into the bigger picture. I did realize I do need a combination of both backgrounds and a little bit of experience just to get a hand on what's clinical trials, how the whole thing is working. So that's why I went to medical school. Mm. And at the time, at the time I was working full time and I started pursuing jobs that actually is going to get me one step closer to becoming just a tiny part of the clinical research space. Uh, so at the beginning, I started working in um, one company that's called C3I. I'm not sure if it's still the name. Um, so basically I was working as a support analyst for Viva, Meditata, uh, different IWRS systems or EDC systems. So I was on the other end of the execution process, but this gave me a great overview and a great experience because it did provide me with some good experience in clinical trials in terms of what works, how, and which role is doing what. I was in daily communication with a lot of CRAs and also my favorite position, drug supply manager. Wow, yeah, because that's so the pharmacy related. So you were you were working with all these vendors. You were saying Viva. Yes. Metadata. Yes. So you uh, that's interesting yeah. how that was your beginning was working with these yeah. portals because mostly people get started and then they, they're given access you know to the various mm -hmm. portals but you Precisely. started like the opposite almost yeah i was supporting all of these systems for different projects and different protocols 
Um, it was great. It was great for a stepping stone in my career. But then I knew I wanted to be a CRA and nothing less. It was my dream job. So mm. I continued, I continued applying to different positions and I faced a whole lot of rejection in the mm. process. I was really frustrating because I remember telling all of my colleagues that one day I'm going to be a CRA and they're going to be the ones receiving emails from me. You know, I'm going to be on the other side and I'm going to be, okay, just wait and see. And everyone <laughs> just laughed at me. They were like, no way. <laughs> Why? It was like, it's unattainable to be a CRA? Or at that time, or it's like very competitive? Uh, back in the days, first of all, there were not that many CRA positions. And mm -hmm. second of all, no one really knew how you become a CRA. It was a little bit of a mystery around it. Uh, but yeah, mm. not so much of a mystery. You almost need like a wizard to help you, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, pun intended. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you almost need a wizard to figure out how to be a CRA. Mm. Maybe still yeah. the case today. Uh, so how did you actually become it, though? Did you apply or what, did somebody see yes. you and ask you or how did that work? Yes, I have applied and applied to numerous positions. And one day I remember at the evening while I was walking my dog in the park and one lady called me and she was the recruiter from a small zero in Bulgaria. They are called Balkan Trials. Mm. Um, they were great, really amazing people. And she was like, yeah, we are interested in eventually hiring you. Would you like to come for an interview? Wow. And I almost lost my shit. <laughs> <laughs> was I it was the so owner or the happy. like the director or who called you? Like the person that owns it or? No, it was the HR, the HR director. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, then I went on an interview with uh, the CEO. I remember I was extremely, extremely nervous as I've never really had previous CRA experience or coordinator experience or assistant experience. Um, so yeah, but I was very enthusiastic, extremely motivated, eager to learn and ready mm. to take the They must have liked the that challenge. you, they probably liked that you used the systems already, right? Like Viva and yeah, all Yeah, they that. really liked that. They really liked that because at the time he was uh, doing some integrations and he really needed someone with in-depth knowledge of exactly how the system worked. So mm. it was it was actually a huge plus, which back then I did not quite realize, but it was a very lucky coincidence yeah. that it happened in this way. Uh, so yeah, next thing you know, that on Monday I started as a CRA. On uh, Friday, <laughs> I had my first visit. <laughs> wow. By yourself or you shadow with someone? No, with shadow, obviously. Yeah. 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 Uh, but he gave me he gave me the car keys and he's like, okay, there you go. Here is your car. Here is your laptop. Good luck. Good luck. So the initially the sites were in Bulgaria, like all around Sofia, or yes, yes, they're in Bulgaria. And uh, yeah, I remember still I was so nervous. I had no idea what I was doing. Luckily, my superior knew better than me. Right. I remember I crashed the car on my first visit on the parking lot in front of the hospital. Seriously. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> so you just like you hit another car or something? And... Yeah, yeah. Wow. The other car was not even moving. I was just trying to go on reverse, and then I just crashed. Wow, that was like must have been like a uh, uh, odd uh, omen <laughs> for your future, but obviously didn't apply because your career thrived since then. <laughs> uh, how so? How did you evolve into CRA? Two and like how how did that work? How many sites do you go outside of Bulgaria? How did you kind of grow your career after that? Right. So I spent uh, more than almost two years in Balkan Trials at the time, and afterwards I've decided to move to a bigger zero. So this is when I started with PSI. I initially started as a CRA one, um, and then a little while afterwards. I transferred to CRA2. So at the moment, I'm monitoring only in Bulgaria. I've never monitored other countries, although wow. I do have some colleagues who do that. And I think it's uh, fascinating, but also very challenging because there is some language barrier. Um, it definitely it definitely depends if you're reading source files in Bulgarian or let's say in Serbian or in English or any other language. Yeah. I mean, even... 
even if you do know some of the languages, as you know, many of the Eastern European languages, they sound and look the same, but it's still challenging when it comes to medical terminology and reading medical charts. So, of course, I was yeah. always curious how that works in uh, Europe because all the countries are so close. Um, if you, English is just the universal language or you can't expect hospitals to use, like do hospitals use English as the language for their notes or they just use the local language? No, right? of course not. They use local language yeah, yeah. Uh, in almost all cases. Mm -hmm. So English is universal in terms that they could all communicate quite well in English, including the investigators, especially the younger generation of investigators. Mm -hmm. uh, they speak English quite well, uh, but they also do go to a lot of conference. They're in constant communication with the study team, yeah. etc. Uh, but in terms of documentation and source files and notes and everything, it's in Bulgarian, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So I was also really curious how when you have an audit on site, the auditor is never Bulgarian. Well, none of the audits that I had, um, the auditor was <laughs> Bulgarian. And they knew perfectly well what is written on each page of the source file without even speaking Bulgarian. So I was like, I, mean, wow, I don't you... understand how <laughs> they must just Google Translate the, uh, the whole sheet. The whole document. Yeah, we're not far from um, where like the documents can be um, uploaded and then translated. I think into any language. I think what that's yeah. going to be like a in two two three years. I think that's going to be like automatic. It's even now, long live Chat GPT four. Ah, okay, yeah, that's true. Even now, yeah, because I know when I yeah. went to Mexico City a few months ago, I visited and everyone, like all well, everyone who worked in research, spoke English like perfect, like you. But wow, then at, nice. at the clinics, when they when you go, you know, it's like not everyone at the clinic does speak English, mm -hmm. right? It's all Spanish and they write everything in Spanish. So you do have to have working knowledge of both English to speak with, to the sponsors and then uh, to your colleagues, uh, but Spanish to speak to the site at, at the site level. Uh, so, yeah, it sounds like it's similar, uh, the same exact thing over there. Do you speak Spanish? See? Yeah, now that I huh? live in a border town in Yuma, Arizona, we're like 30 minutes from Mexico. So, like, every weekend we go. My wife is Mexican. Oh, nice. Yeah, so we go, like, her dad lives still in Mexico. So, yeah, I go. I've been learning a lot of Spanish since I've lived in Arizona these last three years. A lot. So, <laughs> semi-fluent. I think fluent. The only thing missing maybe is the jokes. The jokes are the hardest. Oh yeah. Once you because learn the you need humor, to have the context. Yeah, once you get the humor, you're like fluent, fluent. But I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Uh, I so, can how would people... you rate the experience uh, of having a Mexican wife? <laughs> oh, it's amazing. What do you recommend? What would you recommend to anyone who's marrying a Mexican girlfriend? Uh, wow. Any well... tips? <laughs> Yeah, like don't argue is number one. Like just don't argue with her. Um, but I like think the that's food, universal. that's maybe universal. <laughs> the food is amazing though. Like, and yeah. then the culture is is still similar to Eastern Europe, where family is priority. You know, and I think yeah, I think in the Western world we kind of lost track of that. Uh, we tend to prioritize like individualism instead of family which is um i mean it's unfortunate but it's also like the reason for the progress it's just there always needs to be balance you know and i think like in the u.s especially in the states where there's like a lot of immigrant or like hispanic influence you do have a little bit of both worlds right and um i think i like i like that mix sounds amazing yeah. Seems like you found but, your place under the sun. I think so. I definitely sun. I'm in the sunniest place in the world, Yuma, Arizona. <laughs> if you don't believe me, guys, Google it. Yuma, Arizona, Y-U-M-A, sunniest place on earth. Uh, <laughs> so CRA uh, wizard, right? It's yeah. It's like a Harry Potter type of thing. Like I'm very glad you mentioned it. I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. <laughs> Well, you must be with this logo. So you got the double helix. You've got the uh, wizard yeah. hat, but the wizard hat is also shaped like a um, like a beaker. It's actually it's actually the hat from Harry Potter, the sorting hat. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I, I'm sure I could see that. I subscribe to the CRA Wizard newsletter, but it, I'm very this glad. Is, yeah, this is cool. Like you publish monthly um, articles. I try like, to. Your last yeah. one was revolutionizing clinical research, innovative trial designs, CRA interview prep. Are most of your audience members from Bulgaria or from Europe or all over the place? Actually, all over the place. And I also find it very amazing because um, right now I have three, three hundred, no, sorry, 3,000 uh, subscribers. Yeah, I see uh, this, that. Yeah. Uh, so it's really peculiar to me because each time when I go to an event and I I don't know anyone. And when I go to someone and I introduce myself, last time it was during an investigator meeting uh, two months ago in Monaco. So we were start starting a new study. So actually it was my first investigator meeting in person and I was extremely excited. And I was going around the room and I wanted to speak to everyone. And when I was introducing myself and everyone were like, I know who you are, I'm reading wow. your book. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, really? Wow. That's a, um, that's an I, interesting feeling to have. It felt really weird. And very often I connect with people all around the world. And it's very surprising to me, as it is to you, that so many people are actually following me. Because 3K does not sound that much. But uh, it's, it's, when, uh, when you lot. actually think about, yeah, when you actually think about it, that all of these people are actually reading your articles and following you and engaging with you. Mm -hmm. It's really an amazing feeling, and I'm so grateful for that. And um, yeah, you have one post recently, one-on-one -on -one career consultations, your personal guide to navigating your career, yeah. ghosted by recruiters, don't know how to prepare, fear not, book your slot. Like right now, uh, right now. When you Tamar. read it out loud, it sounds so cringe. <laughs> no, it's not cringe. It's actually good. That's what works for LinkedIn, but. Right now, the market is uh, probably in Europe. It's similar. There was like a, yeah. a big hiring frenzy after COVID. And then mm -hmm. at least at the CRO and sponsor level, and now there's like a hiring freeze almost at That's those true. levels. At the site, it's not the case. Tomorrow for my site, we're interviewing eight people to see because we need another coordinator. I think the sites are in a different world. But the CROs and sponsors, I think they are not hiring right now and what are your experiences with this or is that the case in bulgaria maybe that's not the case i think it's uh, the same way in bulgaria as well actually i was hired during COVID with psi uh however right now i think things things became a little bit more challenging and more difficult the criteria are even more strict than they used to be. It's very, very hard to break into the industry. You need to have background. In almost all cases, you need to have a some sort of life science or medical degree. And you need to have at least one, two years of experience as a CRA in order to be hired as a CRA. Uh, and it's becoming more and more challenging, I think. And since I have so many friends and colleagues from university or people asking me all the time, how can I become a CRA? How can I get a job in clinical trials? And where do I start? And uh, this is why I started these career consultation uh, consultations. They are actually inspired by your CRA Academy. Uh, but you. mine is not, yeah. It's not yet full-blown CRA Academy, but um, at this point, I am able to provide consultations uh, during which uh, I speak with people on different matters, depends on what is their current condition, what kind of role they're aiming to, if it's a CRA or something different, let's say in uh, regulations, in affairs, medical affairs, different sort of roles. And then basically we go through the whole process. How do you break into or how do you excel in your career in clinical trials? There's probably a huge need for this in Europe because it's so the country is obviously fragmented into different countries or the continents fragmented into different countries. So you have different yes. roadmaps and pathways for everyone. But ultimately, I think uh, there is no real resource uh in europe until i 
came across your profile and I said, oh, okay, this is perfect because people need this there. What's like the biggest mistake people make when they're trying to get started and they fail? I feel like there are a few mistakes. Actually, that's a really good idea for an article. So I'm going to write one about this. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I feel like there are a few mistakes in general. First of all, people underestimate the CRA role. So I feel like the biggest mistake people are making is they're thinking that this is an entry level position, which mm -hmm. isn't, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So especially people from medical school, because people who are only studying in medical school, which is great achievement by itself, but if they've never worked in the industry before that, they got the idea that as soon as they graduate, okay, you have your medical diploma or pharmacy diploma, and then great, I'm going to go to an interview to the first company and I'm going to get hired as a CRA. It does not work like that. Definitely does not work like that. So you do need to understand the industry and you do need the relevant combination of background and experience in order to get hired as a CRA nowadays, I think. So instead, you could try with a different position just to break into the industry. Uh, you could obviously start as a coordinator. That's a really, really great crucial role. So you're going to be in contact with all aspects of the work and you're going to get familiar with the clinical trial protocol, all of the systems, all the regulations, all of the processes. You're going to work closely with the CRAs, etc. So that's a great point where you could start from or as a assistant to the CRA. This is also another role or anything else that it's, well, actual entry level position within the industry. So I think that's the first major mistake that people are making. And the other one I think is people can handle rejection, uh, which is a yeah. huge part of the game. And I know it's extremely, extremely overwhelming. And in order to be, in order to become a CRA around here, you need to apply to at least 200 jobs. And mm -hmm. out of these 200 jobs, eventually you're going to speak with maybe five to 10 recruiters. And then eventually, if you're lucky, you're going to get two, three interviews. And eventually, if you're lucky, you're going to get one job offer or two yeah. job offers. And that's so, with, that's after you get experience like as a coordinator or something else related to research that's after it's a lot easier <laughs> yeah yeah like you you know you started working with these systems first then yeah. you got hired and here it's the same mistakes then I, i'm seeing here it's a i think this is just universal like one of the mistakes even they make at the site level so your advice to apply as a coordinator a lot of people take that. I do, I give the same advice, coordinator. The issue is they just apply, like they click, sit on LinkedIn and click, or they go on these job boards and just click a hundred, and then that's it. Like that's yeah. not gonna work. You have to go to the site, like in person. You have to study that site. They all have a website. You can see what studies they do. Like you can see the therapeutic areas. If they don't show the actual studies, they show the therapeutic area. Most of the clinics, at least here in US, have at least a Facebook or an Instagram or something social media. I would assume similar in Europe. Not at all, at least not, not at in all. Bulgaria. <laughs> not in Bulgaria. Here they do, except the academic medical centers don't. But the private sites, they all have at least the an Instagram. Private sites, yes. Yeah, yes. they have to. That's the, way you, the only competitive advantage you have. And they post on these. Look, I'm going to show you guys mine so you guys can see. Because this actually annoys me. That, look, this is ours. Yuma Clinical Trials, right? We have yeah, like I've seen your Instagram. Yeah, like we post, okay, diabetes. So, you know, okay, look at that post. We probably do diabetes study. Look at this one, atopic derm. We probably do atopic derm study. Otherwise, why would we post this one, COPD? We probably do COPD. But the, when you come to the site to get interviewed, you don't know anything of what we do. Even more so, you should know, okay, if it's COPD, you should know common medications, common assessments that all studies share with COPD. You know, you work in yeah. GI and oncology, there's common assessments for no matter what study, if it's the Crohn's, if it's irritable bowel, you're going to have colonoscopy, you're going to have all kinds of things, like different assessments. 
and people like it's not that hard to study this stuff you just have to go a little bit deeper than everyone else and the they don't yeah, put the that's effort true. like everyone else if you put the same effort as everyone else you're gonna get the same results as everyone else you put a little bit deeper effort you can get a little bit deeper results this is uh, i completely agree with you on that and this is something that i always advise my clients and it is to be proactive and to do the extra mile because this is precisely the thing that is going to separate you from the rest of the pile of CVs or the rest of the candidates. And plus, you're going to learn something useful and interesting. So, yeah, I mean, if you're truly interested in it, you're going to, it's not even going to be like work for you. Like, if you're actually interested in GI or oncology, I mean, you're going to actually like your research that you do. Um, yes. So as a CRA too, can you kind of just give a overview of the things you do? Like the difference between CRA one and CRA two, maybe. Um, in my experience, CRA two is, is in general handling more complicated protocols. Is assigned more studies, is assigned more sites, and it is a lot more involved within the startup phase. Mm. with feasibility, preparation, agreements, stuff like that, or at least this is what I do. Uh, currently, I am handling six different studies wow. and lots of sites. <laughs> lots of sites. Like how many? Uh, let me count. No, actually, right now, not more than nine. So that's all right. Still got them. <laughs> nine sites, six no. studies. Yeah. And... Yeah. Um, the protocols I'm working on are quite complicated, especially I have one protocol which is on Crohn disease and it's it's complicated. Definitely, definitely. This is the most complicated study that I've ever worked on. Uh, but the major difference is, I think, in terms of job responsibilities. I've also been involved in uh, feasibility, contracting. Well, not so much contracting, but yeah, helping the startup team with preparing agreements, stuff like that. And wow. I've also enjoyed reaching out to sites and including them in the study myself because I like finding new talents <laughs> among the PIs. Really? Okay, so you yeah. you go it th throughout Bulgaria and look for like potential sites? Not go, but I reach out over the phone. I speak yeah. with them. I contact them. Yeah, and then eventually if they're interested, then I then go, go, yes, yeah. to evaluate the site and... If they're serious wow. about that, if they like the protocol, and I really like that. I so really you're like almost that. like a medical science liaison because over here the, you know, the big drug companies they have sales yeah. reps that go, but then, uh, in charge of the sales rep is usually a pharmacist. We keep coming back to pharmacist, but there's a pharmacist that is called a medical science liaison, and they have like one foot in research, one foot in sales. And there, if you want, if you're a new site and you want to work with, let's say, Eli Lilly, you should find yeah. your medical science liaison in your territory. The, there's usually one person in charge of like entire state. And that's the person that you need to talk to. And then eventually they come visit. So you're doing this role as well. Um, yes and no. In Bulgaria, we also do have medical science liaison. Actually, okay. um, my mentee. Just recently got the job as a medical science liaison. See? Which I Are they a pharmacist? About. Yes, he's See? a pharmacist. Well, I'm <laughs> telling you guys. They're awesome. That's a good uh, job. So yeah, but here, but here medical science liaison is, I think, more on the sales specter. Mm -hmm. And it's in general being handled only by uh, sponsor companies. Yeah. In zeros, there yeah. In zeros, there is no you know, there is no such position. But they are not that involved in the clinical research aspect. I mean, they could be involved in terms of discussing the investigator brochure or the mechanism mm -hmm. of the drug and these kind of things. But they're definitely not in charge of reaching out to sites and asking them if they want to be part of clinical trial. Right. And that's what you guys do as your CRO. That's actually a really proactive move. We don't have too many CROs, I think, that actually do that anymore, which is sad. They just rely on their uh feasibilities uh really yeah uh, we never I'm have really surprised CRO, by that we never have cro reach out and say hey i want to learn more about you i mean we'll get like a feasibility from a cro i never heard of once in a while but like yeah. we never have like the big ones or even the smaller ones say hey do you do this therapeutic area like 
I add a new PI uh, every year, maybe one or two new investigators. So we have new specialists all the time, but they don't never ask. Like nobody ever asks. So you have to, I have to go find those studies and do the surveys right. for my site. No, but I wish somebody like you would find me. Like that would be amazing. I think they should be doing this, Ciro's. Well, keep in mind that Bulgaria is a really small country, so yeah. it's not that difficult to find someone or to reach out or to find someone who knows someone in order to get in touch and then to, well, take a look into their experience and then yeah. just have a chat whether but they're interested or not. But you would think these CROs here in the U.S., they would have at least in every state someone that does what you just said, like look for new sites from the CRO level, like be like a medical science liaison before the CRO. And uh, they don't do they don't do this. I think they rely on the sites to do the that for them. Um, so it's more it might be more competitive here as far as like sites are concerned because they are much more private. Yeah, perhaps I think that's the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, this is a huge part usually of the startup team job. Uh, but occasionally, the CRA <laughs> could also do it. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So what what's next for you? Like, what are you? You have CRA Wizard. You obviously like teaching and doing consulting with people one on one. Yeah. What you're young in your career. I mean, you say back in the day, but you just started <laughs> not that long ago. Um, um. What's next? What do you have like planned for yourself as far as your career? Like, what do you like to do in this space? To be honest, right now, this is a really tough question as I am uh, currently leaving PSI and I'm looking for new job opportunities. Okay. I still haven't found the next big thing that Your I Your LinkedIn's like underneath. <laughs> Everybody get a hold of TL. Yeah, Mira. so if anyone's interested. You see her uh, English. It's amazing. <laughs> Might be better than mine. Uh, oh, seriously, there's... love that there's you guys need to go consider her so i think you can do like a a lot for even like pharma companies are you doesn't look like you worked for a pharma company like a sponsor no i've never worked with a sponsor company mm. um but as i told you the sponsor companies usually tend to hire people with um, only pharmacy or medical diploma and that's the thing that i never completely graduate medical school so i'm a pharmacy graduate but I never completed it. So <laughs> that's but, the reason that I've never worked with a sponsor company. Uh, I see. I think yeah. in the US, I mean, you would probably still get hired, but it, like they wouldn't, they wouldn't make you medical monitor. You know, you'd have to have like an MD or a PharmD. Probably, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. But there's other. But as I told so you here, roles. the criteria are extremely strict yeah. about that. Yeah. So CTM, maybe project manager. I was talking to someone yesterday that was trying to be a CTM. I actually can't remember who now, but somebody, and they were like really close to getting to that point because they were a CRA. Um, ah, the dude from the United Kingdom. He's a CRA too as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you saw I that. Watched, it, I watched, yeah, I watched his video. Yeah. He wants to be a CTM a cool or guy. project manager. Yeah, he seems cool. This is what's awesome about LinkedIn and social media is like we can network and learn from each other. And hey, you know, I'm looking for a role. And you're, I mean, it seems like you're really good at networking. So I think you should be in a good situation. Thank you. Yeah, to be honest, um, I'm not too much in a hurry to find the next thing, but that's the thing that all my life, CRA has been my dream job. Mm -hmm. And recently I just reevaluated. So right now I'm still figuring out what will be the next big thing. To be honest, I'm extremely, extremely interested in clinical research. This is my passion. And I really, really love doing that. It's just that I'm not quite sure exactly if I'd like to stay in this small field of expertise or I'd like to expand a bit further. I'm very interested in generating innovations and even startup space and the med tech and biotech companies and how eventually how these two worlds could be integrated together. So yeah, I guess, I guess I'll figure that out. I am too. I love biotech space. Uh, I'm always studying like the new companies that I'm excited about. Um, Mainly from my investment perspective, but from like obviously the science is what you analyze. 
um, so uh, I find the biotech a lot of opportunities as well. Are there biotech in uh, Bulgaria? Um, there are some, there Yeah. are some biotech companies in Bulgaria, especially there are some really cool startups Mm -hmm. in biotech space. Mm Actually, there is one startup in the med tech space that, you know, it's trial help Maya, Mm -hmm. Ah, Maya, you know her. of course, Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just, yes, for sure. I've interviewed Maya before. And she is, you're right. See, Bulgaria is like robust on its own, on its own right. Um, that's true, Maya. And does she come to your events, networking events? Do you guys network together? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Okay. Actually, first few events we organized together, uh, Okay, but they're still okay. coming to the events. Yeah, she's a very impressive lady. Yeah, I like her. Everyone likes her. Everybody likes her. Um, that's really cool. Yeah. Well, What we we'll about look forward. you? What's the next big thing for you? My site, my site here in Yuma, we're expanding it. We are getting, in the U.S., there's a lot of venture capital that are interested in buying sites. I don't necessarily want to jump to that as my first answer, but with the valuations that like we're getting, it's ridiculous not to consider it. And my staff, they're aware, more or less. Uh, my first priority is make sure that my staff's taken care of because they're like my team, you know, we're a small team. So, and luckily the people who are interested in buying sites, they have no interest in letting people go. They need actually more people. Um, so Yeah. I'm, my goal is to expand the site this year and explore like opportunities to either sell or like a hybrid sell some, but remain as part of the larger network. Like so that when they grow it, I still have a uh, ownership in it. Um, and then honestly, biotech like you, Biotech is, I've been doing clinical research at the site level for two decades. I've been a CRA for like three to five years during that time, like as a contract CRA. So I've, I've actually monitored like you oncology and GI and uh, some psych Nice. as well. I've monitored some uh, Alzheimer's uh, Me too. and Alzheimer's <laughs> and depression. yeah. There's a lot of depression studies too. Like a lot of my site right now in Yuma has a lot of depression studies. We just got offered like four depression studies in the last month. So we're going to have like, if Yeah. you screen <laughs> fail on this one, you get this one, you could try all of them. Um, I think it's good. Biotech though, for me, is something I've been focused on. I'm a fan. I enjoy watching the stocks of the biotech companies because when they have something innovative, all the innovations coming from the biotech, it's not coming from Exactly. pharma. Pharma is Exactly. just buying the biotech. They're not innovating anymore. That's the thing. And this is why I'm very excited about the biotech space. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the And future. That's the also future the of tech. medicine. I've been doing some advising for tech startups in research. So there's an AI company that we're working with, Select IQ. I'm an advisor. They're looking at um, EMRs, but with AI. So they train Mm. the... AI on certain studies and then they find you the patients automatically. Oh, okay. Okay. So they're evaluating basically, they're doing press screening of patients in Basically, general. but like imagine like 10,000 patients in a database. You don't know where to start. You know, you just get lucky Wow. and find one. This is going to show you all of them that are likely to qualify and they give them like a score. So now you don't have to waste your time looking. Now you just Sounds call, great. you know, call, text, And then there's another company I'm an advisor with, but the, I can't really say much what they do, but it also involves AI. And they're not ready to release yet, but we're working with it. So my site is like a playground for these tools. Um, so I enjoy advising and ha having like a stake in the company as well. That kind of stuff is, of course, these podcasts. I mean, I don't think I'll ever stop doing this stuff. Um, it's too fun. The podcast is amazing. And uh, I think that you're always podcasting with very interesting people and you're meeting people from all around the world and you get different Yeah, perspectives. So that's really interesting. it's so cool. Like, I wouldn't trade this for anything. Um, 
but I think the sites, uh, even if I sell this one, there will be more sites. I think that's in my DNA to start sites and grow them. Um, but the, on this one, I'm actually in the trenches with the coordinator. Like I'm doing everything they do. I draw blood. I still draw blood today. I call patients. I I buy them sandwiches. I bring dry ice. <laughs> like I do everything the coordinators do as well. Um, so well, I, I think that's the best approach because you have very hands-on approach with your sites, yeah, and yeah. ultimately, this is what makes your sites that that successful. And I think it's what keeps the coordinators around because I never ask them anything that yeah. I haven't done. And so, you know, you have some managers that have never done what they're asking you to yeah. do. That's not the case with me. I tell them everything I'm asking you to do, I've done it myself. And I know if you're telling me it's too much work, I know because I've done it if it's too much work or not. And so I the, think having that's a that relationship. Point. Yeah, more managers need that. And I think when these big companies start buying sites, I think that dynamic is going to change. But, you know... Not that becomes, necessarily. Uh, not hopefully necessarily. not. Hopefully not. They need to bring you the right still people. Still keep your culture. Well, they need to bring people like you to advise them. That's perhaps, what they need. perhaps. Yeah. But this is a crucial point for coordinators, and this is something I've been facing throughout my career in many, many sites and studies. It's just that coordinators are constantly leaving and they're usually switching yeah. on six months or one year interval because usually they're overworked and they give them like 36 protocols to handle at once. 36? I'm going to show I'm my not, coordinators this video. <laughs> I'm not even joking. This is just, wow. it's ridiculous amount of work. And each time I go on a visit or I call them for some queries or anything, and every time they're so overwhelmed and so overworked, not not in all not in all sites is like that, but in some sites that is the case. And uh, yeah, so I find myself in a situation that I constantly have to train uh, new study coordinators over and over again, uh, but then they just burn out so fast. Yeah, or they get recruited to be CRAs. And, yeah, or they know, get recruited. And then the site needs to continue. We're always interviewing, hiring more. We've been able to keep, luckily, this current four coordinators um, for a while. I don't think they're leaving anytime soon. But in the yeah, because the... you have nail salon next to your. <laughs> oh, you saw that? Yeah, we got the nail salon there. <laughs> you know who opened an, in the next office? I have to do a podcast there. Is the oxygen tank? So they're like, you go in this thing that looks like a submarine for an hour. <laughs> I'm gonna do a podcast from inside there. And uh, you definitely should. I will. And and you get like pure oxygen for like an hour. I haven't done it yet, but they say you sleep so good. You feel so good afterwards that you could do it once a week, once a month, however long you want to do it. They have like that's the new business that opened in the other suite next to us. So you got the nail and then you got and it's about the same price. So if you don't want your nails done, <laughs> we'll get you some oxygen. Uh, there's a lot of good neighbors we have in that building. <laughs> I'm just thinking this is so great for diving. I mean, it's a great prep before you go diving. So <laughs> True, true. Yeah, uh, O2 Rejuvenation, that's right. And there's a few other businesses there. Um, but yeah, the uh, retention is very important for the staff because if you take care of the staff, they will take care of the patients. You know, otherwise the manager is going to have to do all the work. I don't mind doing it myself, but the goal is to have a business, right? Not a job. Like, right. I don't need a job for me. I need a business. And so working on building the system is important. You got to take care of your staff in order to have a business. Otherwise you don't have a business. I really like your mindset. I mean, you have the mindset of a good leader and not many people have that. Thank so... you. Yeah, I think greed gets in the way um, of a lot. but Maybe. The irony is that if you actually do this, you'll make more. <laughs> but people are so short-sighted. Oh, no, I can't invest because it's uncertain. Okay, well, then you're never going to see what's on the other side. I mean, yeah, and just like a jobs you were saying, rejection. I mean, in business, you will fail as well. Especially in business. Yeah. And it's a matter of just knowing when to say, okay, I lost, but I learned. 
and time to do it differently time to figure out how else it's going to work like why did it why did i fail a lot of time it's your own fault no one else mm. how do you usually hire your people how do you choose your team it's happening tomorrow again yeah so we're doing uh my wife does hr thank god okay they thank god the staff we have currently this is bad i never told anyone outside of our work everyone that applied through uh indeed it's the website yeah we get all these applications i kid you not okay I'm not a mean person. I put everyone in the trash. Everyone. No, no, really no, no, no. Yeah. Because I know. Here's why. We have four people. I'm so careful about who's this next person. I don't want to bring anyone. <laughs> That's the problem. And my wife goes in the trash can and rescues people. Oh, so then that's she's nice like, of her. no, this one you got to interview. So tomorrow we have eight. And I'm really like hire slow and fire fast is like my strategy. I haven't had to fire anyone in Yuma, but hire really slow, even if it means not to hire right now. And uh, she's good at like seeing the potential on paper. And then when we interview, I'm like, you know what? I'm glad you took this one from the trash can <laughs> <laughs> because then now that she's here, you know, we have most of our staff ended up from the trash can to the coordinator and it's because uh, you of, should really it's tell them that it's very motivating they know all of them know i think the only one wasn't in the trash can was lana and it's because i, I wasn't uh involved in that part at that time i was probably doing a podcast but uh tomorrow is eight people i didn't touch any of them this time so mm. i didn't put anyone in the trash can um, my wife just selected them all and we're going to go interview all eight tomorrow. And if nobody, if it's zero that we find, we won't hire and we'll do another interview like next week. Um, and if we find two people that are really good, I'll have the entire team interview both and see what they think. And if they all like both, then we'll hire both. And if they don't like one, this happened last time. I We found two people, and then we had the rest of the coordinator interview them, a second interview, and the team didn't like one of the two that we selected. So we only hired Okay. one. We only hired one. Uh, it's very Wow. important because it just with a small team, the wrong person will make people want to quit, will make people, you know, go do something else, less motivated. So you got it. When you have a small team, it's super important to be – very methodical in how you hire. So that's how we select. Once we find that person, like I put them under my wing. At that point, I become like friend, like very friendly. I'm My weakness is like I'm too nice to my staff. That's my weakness. But because of that, I know how I am. That's why I put everyone in the trash initially because I know it's a lot of effort. So I don't actually Yeah. want to do, I don't actually want to do it. <laughs> that's the thing. But once they're hired, It's like my goal, even after they leave, I still give them advice. Hey, you should go apply here. You should go. I still communicate with former staff. Like they text me um, advice. I want to start a site. I have a good relationship with 90% of my former staff. Not everyone, Sounds great. not everyone loves me, but like the majority, we have a good working relationship even after they no longer work. And a few of them even become like business partner, like Monica Quitiva, um, who runs CRC Academy, Latinos in Clunker Research. We got to get you on that thing too, La Latinos in Clunker Research. But she was a coordinator of mine and then she became a business partner. So I know the dedication it's going to take on my part. That's why initially everyone goes in trash. <laughs> but uh, that's why. But luckily I have a wife who takes people out of the trash can. So she's doing the important job for you. Yeah. And when you need to have like a conversation, hey, you know what? You're not pulling your weight or what's been going on this last week. You know, I'll have those talks. But when things are not getting improved, she has those more difficult conversation with them because I'm like too much of a friend. 
I think. And that's mm. the problem. That's the side effect of working with them side by side. Yeah. Is like they forget you're a boss. And uh, it's good and bad to that. But it's how I've been my whole career. I definitely feel your pain. And I completely agree on that. I also tend to be extremely friendly with my sites. Well, most yeah. of my sites. Yeah. To that extent that we go on lunch together on Sunday yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes it may not be the best strategy because after all, no. you need to get work done. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. So. But I found that if I do that and then I have to have a serious conversation with one of them. They actually take it seriously because they're like, wow, I mean, yeah. he never he never actually does this. So they do a lot. Of, if you hire the right person, they they will respond the right way to the serious conversations. Every now and then I have to have, you know, maybe once a month. Hey, you know what? You haven't like what's going on? I mean, we're here to have fun. I want you guys to have fun. But why are these patients not getting called on time? Like, do you need me to hire someone else or I'll do it? And they're usually like, no, no, sorry, you know, yeah, you're right. And then they, they yeah. shape up. But it's every now and then, you, I'm getting better. When I first started, terrible. Like 15, 19 years ago, terrible. But I think as I'm older, I get better at that team. Was it extremely overwhelming to start your first site? Oh, yeah, I have hypertension because of it. Um, <laughs> I was put, I was 25 with hypertension. And yeah. I went to the doctor. I'm like, I don't know why I'm 25. I shouldn't have like, it was like 160 over 90. I'm like, why am I blood pressure like this? And he's like, I don't know. Are you stressed? And I'm <laughs> like, most likely. So they put <laughs> me on lisinopril. <laughs> put me on lisinopril from like 25 years old. Like there's a real sacrifice. I have genetic predisposition to hypertension, but yeah, like it takes a toll on your health. Of course, like, you know, it. if I would have just sat home and read books, I probably would have delayed my hypertension for like five years, maybe 10. But because maybe I'm, more. Maybe more, but because I'm active and monitors are yelling and, you know, like the site was a disaster when I took over. Monitors are yelling. Monitors I've never yelled, yelled in my and, life. But this was 2000. <laughs> Not even once. This was 2005. I noticed a change in monitor attitude after the Great Recession of 2008-2009. Right. I noticed monitors being more, much more friendly, like you. Pre-Great Financial Crisis, half of them were mean, like cold. Like I had one rip off things off my wall in my office. Like, she's like, this doesn't go there. I had a schedule of assessment on the wall oh, so that wow. I, like, when a patient comes, I could look really quickly, right, and see what, this was before eSource. And she's like, no, that doesn't go there and took it out, like, rip it off. I'm like. That's impressive. Yeah, but I was brand new, so I thought this was normal. <laughs> I was like, okay, maybe I did something wrong. Oh, like, poor guy. It was bad, I'm telling you. But it, everything I learned in that first three years helped for the youtube channel and yeah that's when i felt like okay i mean other people are probably starting now let's teach them how to do this but initially the youtube was to get patients but that didn't work within two months i learned that that failed no patient was watching the only people watching were other sites so i made a video what is an informed consent what is an irb i thought yeah. patients would want to be interested no patient cared the only people cared were coordinators. Hey, thank you for that. Can you make one on this? Yeah. So then I was like, oh, okay, maybe I should just make videos for researchers instead of patients. And that's how the YouTube channel started. I have to say your five hour long video on crash course. On oh, man. <laughs> I really can't tell you how many times I rewatched this one. That was a pain to make. And a pain to upload, but uh, we got it done. We're thinking of doing a revise of that in a few years, but right now it's still, I think it's still good. Please keep the whiteboard. 
I really liked. The whiteboard? Okay, I'll do the whiteboard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll keep the whiteboard. But yeah, we're thinking of doing it. But yeah, I mean, I'm excited about this, the future of our industry. There's a lot of changes coming, but I think those changes are good. I've seen the industry improve for the better. Like I said, the monitors are pleasant now. Um, the Oh, so technology... there is no more paper CRF. <laughs> No more paper C. I came with the first, uh, the first study I did, paper CRF. Me too. Oh, oh five, and then after that, everything <laughs> EDC. So yeah, I remember I remember my that. first study. My first study was actually on paper CRF. So I did not get to work with electronic CRF as a monitor until I started with PSI. Before that, Hmm. I used to monitor everything on paper and also to data collect all of the information in the trunk of my car. <laughs> Wow, it's un unbelievable how that was Oh, like yeah. considered okay. Fun times. Uh, <laughs> what about eSource in Europe? Do they use have they adopted <laughs> eSource and e regulatory, or is it mostly paper? uh, it's only paper at this point. They are talking about it. But right now, some of these sites are actually adopting um, electronic on site file, which is groundbreaking. Um, but yeah, still no electronic source file and Okay. no electronic ICF, which is something really great that I'm looking forward to. I know that in the US they're using Yeah, it a lot, we're using but here it. not yet. We use Not eSource, yet. ereg, eConsent, although sometimes the coordinators still prefer paper consent. I think it's because of the patients. But uh, eSource, ereg, for sure, we have like Wow. 90% electronic, only a few paper, like lab results. PI still likes to sign by hand. ECG, They you like know. to sign by hand. The PI, yeah. They want to see the... They don't want to log into Right. a website. They want to see, like, Yeah. you bring them. Here you go. You know, they want, like, Yeah. like a restaurant. But yeah, all of these things right now, it's like you're coming from the future. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> it's going to happen over there, too. Creo is a really good one. They're a sponsor of the show, too. C-R-I-O. Nice. Yeah, they're. I like them a lot. They're cool. They're all, always working on... innovation uh, patient database paying patients with debit cards instead of cash automatic invoicing it's really cool it make my life easier as a site owner Yes, I can imagine. Actually, I'm very much pushing forward towards this, this direction. And uh, I've always come up to my bosses with bright ideas, how to include this innovation or that innovation. I feel like I'm pain in their asses. yeah Uh, <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to it. Yeah, Maya would be a good person to collaborate with because she's amazing from the few Yeah. podcasts I've done with her. Yeah, she's all about digitalization and innovation Oh, yeah. Well, she likes it too and much. the bright future ahead of us. She lives in the future. I've been on her <laughs> podcast too. She yeah, lives I've in the seen future. it. I mean, I'm like an earthling compared to her. She's like in the outer space. So, yeah, I'm not that Yeah, much she's technology. a comet. She is. I'm not like that. You know, I want to, the tech has to make sense. I'm not going to go out of my way to prove a tech is useful. If you prove it, I'll use it. Right. But I'm not going to, unless I'm an advisor, then I would work with it. But otherwise, I'm not going to try just because you say it's a good idea. No, show me like in real life how this works. I have staff that I, if I give them this and they don't like it, they're going to quit. So no, Yeah. you you make sure it works before you have me tra check it out. Actually, I, I really love that you're saying that because right now I do have an idea that I'm testing on and working on. It's Ah. a, uh, yeah, but it's still in extremely early stage. We So got entrepreneur in the house. <laughs> <laughs> I'd still like to check well precisely that if it's going to make coordinators and monitors job easier or not or PI's job in general so once it's more or less ready I'd love for you to test it so Yeah. I'll ping you later <laughs> No, no, for sure. I love that kind of stuff. Um, especially if you go the startup route. I'm interested in those things like advisory stuff. I definitely keep that in mind. Yeah, it's it's an idea I'm exploring. Yep. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Look, everybody needs to go connect with Tihomera right now. 
LinkedIn. Her LinkedIn's underneath. And if you're listening on the podcast, same thing. Go connect. Entrepreneur Spirit CRA. Probably going to be doing all kinds of things for the next few decades in our space. CRA Wizard. Uh, if you need help and you're in Europe. I mean, everybody go connect with her right now. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And we'll do a part two at some point in the future. Like, subscribe, I'd comment, love that. share. Bye-bye, guys.